Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios, featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. My guests on the show work with a variety of partners to move the economy and business growth forward, each representing a different part of the Blue Ridge PBS coverage area. John Hall is Executive Director for the Roanoke Regional Partnership. Jamie Glass is Director of Economic Development for the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance. And Charlie Jewell is Executive Director of Onward NRV. Let's start out, let's go around the room. Uh, what has a year plus of the pandemic done to your organizations as far as uh, efforts to attract new business to the region? And is it picking up lately? Let's, uh, let's start with Charlie. Yeah, so, you know, as with every other industry, we, we certainly weren't uh, expecting a pandemic a year ago, a little over a year ago at this point. Uh, and it certainly shifted a lot of the things that we were doing um, and, and being less of a, 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 you know, proactive going outbound, trying to develop new business leads to really paying more attention uh, within our region to try to help us adjust uh, and, and make it through the pandemic and not just us, but really the businesses that we're having to uh, figure out how to navigate and still operate uh, with a global pandemic. So it's been quite the shift. Uh, the second part of your answer or your question, uh, certainly I feel like things have picked up uh, since the beginning of the year um, based on some activity that we're seeing. So we're very excited about that. Uh, you know, there's, it's no uh, surprise that as more people get vaccinated, more people, the business community is feeling more comfortable with uh, executing on plans that maybe they had been sitting on uh, due to just uncertainty uh, in the economy. Jamie Glass in, in the Lynchburg area and Bedford area, seems like thing, in Lynchburg, things were going great guns. There's downtown apartment buildings going in. Star Hill was opening a, a brew pub downtown. There was all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, what happened when the pandemic hit in the throes of the pandemic? W were the brakes put on a lot of that or did things kind of move along? You know, the brakes were put on some, you know, right there at the very beginning. I think there was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to happen. And, you know, uh, just like what Charlie said, we kind of shifted more from, you know, recruiting outbound. We created some task force within the region, you know, our locals really trying to help them figure out how to disperse care funds. And, you know, we were meeting to say, what's your community doing? What's your community doing? And, you know, collectively working together to try to just help the business community where they were, because, you know, we saw the big biggest hit for hospitality, restaurants, you know, obviously folks in that arena, entertainment venues that were getting hit really hard. Um, we were very fortunate that a lot of our manufacturing companies, you know, were able to step up and actually start adding to or helping in the process of creating PPE. And, you know, so we really saw some of our businesses come together to, to really aid and, you know, helping with COVID. And so that was really great as well. So, um, but definitely, you know, some hiccups, but we're, um, you know, now starting to see a lot of pickup and activity. I think a lot of companies realized during the pandemic, especially those, you know, outside of the U.S., they need to be a little bit closer to their customers when things like this happen. So we've seen quite an uptick in international requests um, since COVID. Since you brought it up, how much did local, state, and federal funds through the CARES Act or other funds, Jamie, how much did it mean to uh, businesses in your region? I think it was critical to a lot of them, especially those that had to just completely shut down, um, you know, being able to keep their employees on board and, you know, um, you know, a lot of those ended up being forgiven. And so, I mean, it, it was critical. I mean, it was absolutely critical to keeping people um, going. I mean, I even, we had really creative um, things happening. I mean, we, our city ended up buying a lot of patio heaters for our restaurants who still needed to be able to utilize their outdoor dining space um, so they could continue to have that extra, just if it's five or six extra seats. I mean, that means a lot. And so, um, I've just seen businesses be so creative, which I think is is wonderful, you know, when you can think outside of the box and, and solve some of these problems. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, Charlie, even in the NRV, I think uh, there were even some uh, ordinances or whatever that were kind of adjusted a little, a little bit so that people could do more outdoor dining longer and that type of thing. 
Yeah, and you know, even statewide with uh, the the relaxation of some of the, the, the uh, regulations around selling alcohol uh, through the delivery uh, or takeout orders, uh, I think you know, of course, we we have a couple college towns in the NRV, so uh, with Blacksburg and Christiansburg, so you know, the bar scene and and is a big driver of our economy uh, locally in those towns specifically, so. Uh, yeah, being able to relax some of those uh, uh, regulations to allow businesses to utilize as much space as they could um, during the pandemic when physical distancing was so important certainly helped them uh, accommodate more customers and certainly I think help people feel more comfortable going out uh, to dine in those establishments when um, you know the risk of catching COVID is, uh, can't be completely mitigated. Right. Well, I knew I knew the world had changed when I was able to walk out of my favorite Mexican restaurant with a four pack of margaritas last year. So, yeah, you know, John, John Hull, uh, you became executive director for the Roanoke Regional Partnership at the beginning of the year. Great timing, John. Uh, but you had you succeeding Beth Dowdy, but you've been on the staff for a while. And what's your recollection about how the Roanoke region got through the past year where there are some businesses that fell by the wayside or did everybody for the most part or most people kind of hold on? Well, you know, Gene, uh, there there have been impacts uh, to the to the regional economy. You know, typically, I mean, and, and as has been typical statewide in the hospitality, you know, leisure industry, and so forth. Um, however, you know, there's a lot of reason for optimism. I think, Gene, and uh, you know, the Roanoke Regional Partnership. We launched Roanoke Region Responds right away. It was a resource for businesses to to learn about resources um, available to them, for state, federal, regional. Um, in, in the midst of the pandemic. Um, now we're seeing pretty strong recovery and employment. Uh, I think we're seeing a pretty strong uh, activity in the consumer sector as well. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of success uh, in, in, in terms of our, our lead activity. Uh, you know, and we're, we're staying pretty, really, really busy. We had a couple announcements this year already. Uh, Munters uh, Cor Corporation, as well as uh, Balchem. Um, yeah, Munters is uh, relocating to Botetourt and, and Balchem's expanding in Allegheny County, and so um, we're, we're having a we're, we're having a good year, and and I think there's a lot of reason for optimism looking ahead. Munters is over 200 jobs, I think, John. Initially, climate control uh, manufacturing is going to move to the Botetourt Center at Greenfield, and I guess one of the things they said was that there's a potential in the Roanoke Valley, a bigger population, a bigger uh, pool of talent here, or employee pool, that's gotta be music to your ears. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it will support growth for that business in, in the years ahead. And um, I think it's an exciting opportunity for, for them and for the Valley. We, we can look ahead to, to, to further further growth. I know I was talking to one hotelier in the, to the, 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 the teeth of the, pandemic last year, John, and they told me business was down 90% or something at one point. So it's, uh, and I know there were a couple of hotel projects that were maybe put on hold, new construction projects because, but uh, you see, you see things on the upswing though this year. Yeah, I do. I, I do. I, I mean, I have no, no reason to, to have anything other than op optimism with the vaccine rollout and so forth. You know, I think there's a lot of pent up demand for travel. I've had some conversations to land and Howard to visit uh, Virginia's Blue Ridge and, uh, He's got a great team and uh, great plans moving ahead there. And uh, I think uh, just lots of reason for optimism across the board. All right, uh, Charlie Jewell with Onward NRV. By the way, uh, Charlie, th that organization used to be called the New River Economic Development Alliance. What did the change to Onward NRV connote? Yeah, so we actually went through an organizational branding process where we uh, actually hired an agency to come in to help us figure out who are we as an organization and, and what, uh, what, what do we want to be known for. And, you know, one of the reoccurring themes as they went around the region and talked to our stakeholders was um, within our culture as an organization, just this movement of trying to pull the region together and move it onward. Uh, so the cursive O within our name, uh, within the logo is actually symbolic of that, of us working to again, pull the region together and help us move us uh, onward. I know, Jamie, uh, actually the Lynchburg Regional Business Alliance was formed in 2016. That was emerging, this is interesting, of the Lynchburg Chamber of Commerce 
and the Region 2000 Business and Economic Alliance. Uh, did it just make sense to kind of pool resources and go from there? And I think you've worked with both organizations. Yeah, so I, when I first started, I was with the Region 2000 Economic Development Alliance. We were small staff, but um, you know, it just made sense to put these two organizations together. We were serving the same businesses. We had a lot of the same you know, missions and things we were working on workforce and, you know, business recruitment. And, you know, we love those new big projects coming into the, you know, the area, but really about 85 to 90% of our job growth is within companies that are already here. Mm -hmm. So um, we kind of really at that time was looking at putting back together a, uh, what we call business retention expansion program, where we're going out meeting with our companies that are already here, asking them what's good, how can we help you, what policies are in place that maybe aren't you know, making it the most business friendly and let's help, you know, kind of change that. And so it just made sense for these two organizations to, you know, to kind of come together to continue to just serve better, serve businesses in a more holistic approach. Let's talk about the concept of regionalism with, with all of you folks. And uh, John Hull, um, you know, the, the Roanoke Regional Partnership, how many localities are you involved with? We, we have eight local government okay. teams. So, so, you know, when a project comes in and they want to build a plant or something, how do you make sure everybody plays nice? You know, one locality wants it here, it's bragging rights versus here. This is really a better site over here. Uh, but, you know, but you can draw jobs from all over the area. How do you make that work? Well, Gene, we, you know, we have, we have agreements in, in, uh, with, with governments and protocols in, in terms of how we handle projects and leads but you know generally uh it generally doesn't really work like that i mean you know uh they all really are strong partners um they understand the regional impact they understand that uh, the rising tide lifts all ships so to speak um and we all understand i think that it's a, a region a regional uh shared workforce so to speak as well you know residents uh obviously will live in one locality work in another um, and that happens all the time um but our, our governments are really strong partners and it, it, it's it's uh while certainly they all have, have interest in landing you know the deal themselves uh it, it really is about matching the project with the right asset whether that be infrastructure the site uh workforce programs and you know some of the, some local assets as well as regional assets and, and generally the location is driven by by the right asset mix Charlie Jewell, talk about on with NRV and the partners you work with. Uh, uh, does it all mesh together? Do people see the common goal? Yeah, and you know, for us, we serve a four county, one city, and ten town area, uh, ranging everywhere from uh, Pulaski South uh, to Blacksburg North uh, to you know the West Virginia line in Giles County to Floyd County to our east. Um, and, you know, just kind of like John said, you know, we, what I love about regional economic development organizations in Virginia for the most part is that they're a bottom up approach. So we're not funded or mandated by the federal government or uh, the state government, but it was the localities within the footprints of each of our organizations that chose that it was in their best interest to, to essentially form these organizations and work together. And that's the spirit, um, you know, our organization has been around since 1990 uh, and that spirit still lives on today. Um, you know, it is a competitive sport, economic development, uh, but you know, these projects are so hard uh, to land because there are so much competition and really the competition isn't within our regions uh, because we're lucky, it's kind of like buying a house. At, at a certain point, all of the assets or infrastructure may be equal, but it may be this building or this site is a better fit for their operation. Mm. So, you know, we're really, um, and I think that's the bigger picture that I've, our folks see is that, you know, a lot of times it's apparent why they were eliminated. Um, and then in hopes if they can't win it, the attitude in the Newer Valley is they hope someone else in the NRB uh, will land the project. Uh, John Hall, I see you shaking your head. How hard is it to land an Eldor manufacturing, a Ballast Point, a uh, Stick Pack Solutions at the new Summit View Business Park in Franklin County? How hard is it to do that when you're competing with other localities in the state, in the region? Uh, just talk about how difficult that process can be. 
Sure, Gene. And, you know, the competition really, I mean, sort of there's competition with other regions in the state, but it's really, you know, throughout the Southeast United States and maybe even beyond. I mean, that, that, that's really the competition. And, it, and, you know, Gene, it is very difficult. And, it, and you have to have, and that's why, you know, site preparedness, real estate readiness, I mean, that's that's huge. Um, because if you can't just, uh, most clients are not going to take the time, right, to, to prepare a site um, when they can find it elsewhere, right? And so to be competitive, you know, you have to have the right real estate, you have to have the infrastructure in place. Um, you need to have a ready and skilled workforce and our training partners in, in, in this end of Virginia, I think are all very excellent. Um, so, you know, what, what we have largely is uh, in, in the talent space is a, is a numbers problem, you know, so that's why it's so important. And it's why we've worked on quality of life to really attract and retain young residents but but gene going back to what you say it, uh, it is a difficult uh, sport we do find success in, in, in it uh, but it is a competitive environment and again the competition is not down the street it's really across the country and, and even around the world in some cases and you talk about a numbers game john and i'm sure you may all well agree with this that it, do we just need to attract more talent here more people a bigger population base of talented people is that part yeah, of the problem gene, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's in a nutshell, that, I mean, that's why I think all three of our organizations have uh, engaged in talent initiatives um, because this end of Virginia. Um, it, you know, we, we have an aging population in, in this end of Virginia. It's, the, the whole, the entire nation is aging, but in a lot of ways, we're ahead of that curve. Our median age is, is pretty high. Um, if we're going to grow through natural increase, if we're going to, you know, if, if we're going to have births that exceed, you know, deaths moving ahead, and if we're going, you know, if we're going to grow through migration, we've got to attract and retain that, you know, the workforce. We got to attract and retain younger professionals, and and um, and, and see success in that. Uh, it's important from a workforce standpoint. It's important from just general economic growth standpoint. That's that, you know, that was one of the driving forces behind the uh, Roanoke Outside Initiative, and a focus on quality of life to get our message out and let people know. Um, the advantages of uh, of livability here in the region. Mm -hmm. Jamie Glass, talk about what's unique about your region. You've got one fairly big sized city, Lynchburg, a few major manufacturers. Liberty University is a big impact player there. And you've got a lot of more rural areas. I know the forest area in Bedford County sort of become a bedroom community for Lynchburg. But what's unique about the partners that you work with? And I think, you know, just going back to what we were talking about, about age, it's interesting. If you look at our regional median age, it's 42. If you look at the city's median age, it's at 28 right now. So I think that's really showing, you know, younger people want to be in that urban environment. And so that's why we're really seeing a lot of that growth in our downtown. You know, I think we've had 18 new restaurants pop up within the last two years. Um, you know, hotel renovations, lofts, and, you know, these things where young professionals want to just, they don't want the yard maintenance. They don't want the, you know, I want to go do out, do what I want to do after work and not have to worry about coming home, taking care of my, my yard and my house. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, when you look at the data, you, you see those trends, it's very easy to see those things. And so um, for us, you know, and I know everybody on, on here too, Charlie and John have, a very similar situation where it might have a little bit more of that urban area, but then we have a lot of rural areas and, you know, rural, obviously um, broadband, you know, continues. And I think with COVID that's one of our biggest challenges for our rural communities. So Virginia is really stepping up, I think, and trying to, to get some funding and helping um, these communities try to solve some of these problems. And there's, there's a lot of pieces to it. You know, you've got, the providers and you know the infrastructure and who provides that last mile and you know i mean there's a lot of complications to it but i think we're starting to figure it out but that's going to be to me the biggest critical piece of moving our rural communities forward we're never going to get businesses we're never going to get residents if they can't get connected i mean it's it's essential as electricity at this point um, for operations and you know, I mean, we're all been virtual schooling our children this year. I mean, you know, not being able to have your kids get online. Um, it, and COVID, I think, has really put a spotlight on how important it is for us to be able to be connected, even when we can't really be connected. So um, that's a huge initiative for us right now that we're working on. You mentioned the younger median age in Lynchburg City. Does the, does the, uh, does the Alliance maybe work hard to keep 
Liberty grads, University of Lynchburg grads, Randolph grads in the area once they graduate, you know, maybe through mixers or job fairs or things. Is that is that a focus? What are the focuses for the Alliance? Yeah, so I actually manage our young professionals of Central Virginia. So it's a kind of a committee within the Alliance. We have about a close to 200 members at this point, but we do try to, you know, target Liberty, especially those, um, you know, post-grad people that are a little bit more, they know where they're going in their career. Maybe they're in law school, maybe they're in medical school. Um, you know, it, it is critical to keep talent in our region. And a lot of that came out of this initiative that the three of our organizations did a couple years ago it was a brain drain study. Like we really wanted the data to say, who's staying here? If they are, why? If they're not, why? Um, you know, and we find in Lynchburg, our biggest challenge is people wanna be there but people love being there. So a lot of times people don't quit their jobs, they don't move. So where we lose people are in that middle management, young professionals that are really wanting to grow, you know, up that ladder. Um, they kind of get stuck sometimes there and, and can't, mm -hmm. can't progress. And so, you know, that's one of our focuses. How do we, how do we kind of help that challenge? How do we figure that out? But um, definitely that leading off campus was another program that came out of the initiative that we did with with these partners um, which is really getting students into the community it's really easy to get into your university bubble right and you you know you you don't get into the community quite as much but Liberty has a really interesting program where they, it's called LU serves um, it's a community service program and I think just that, it gets students out into the community. They meet other people. They learn about the organizations and nonprofits that we have that they can you know, be a part of and help. And so I think that's one of the reasons we see our retention rate so high, specifically for that university. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the brain drain and people leaving. John Hall, I know when Beth Dowdy was there, about 10 years ago, I remember she went to, before city council and said, we need to start really pushing our outdoor amenities that there's people in the Roanoke Valley that don't even know where the Appalachian Trail is. And it seems like, you know, Roanoke Outside, which is an arm of the regional partnership, really took off, you know, put the marathon together. But, but talk about, has that been successful? You've been written up in all kinds of magazines, the area, has that been successful, do you think, about attracting more attention and more talent to the region? Yeah, Gene, without question. I mean, you know, we, you know, we build a network of, of outdoor enthusiasts and users, and you know, we we know anecdotally, you know, some of those folks have, have relocated through the region over over the years. Um, with, without question, it's been successful. The you know Blue Ridge Marathon has uh, attracted uh, millions of of, uh, of of new dollars to the region. I think in excess of five or six million over the years um, of economic impact. It's been a key initiative. I mean, in, in Gene, what's what's really interesting, I think, about Roanoke Outside is uh, not only does it attract residents, but you know, traditional medicinals like in Franklin County, uh, that brand fit, you know, with with their corporate uh, brand of, of, of the outdoors and livability was was key to them, and that and we've seen that um, again and again in projects uh, over time uh, in the Roanoke region is the uh, the outdoors has supported traditional business attraction efforts, not only just talent attraction. Hmm. We've only got a couple of minutes left. I want to ask Charlie Jewell. Uh, I used to live in Boulder, Colorado at one point, Charlie, and there were a lot of people that stayed in Boulder after they got out of University of Colorado for years. They might have a master's, but they'll they'll wait tables for a while or until they get their startup going because they just love the area. Are you seeing that in the area from Virginia Tech and from Radford where people want to stay in the area because they like the quality of life? And is that part of the challenges of, uh, you know, creating enough opportunities so that those people stay here. Yeah, and yeah, we're fortunate, you know, with both universities where, you know, you have people that go to school at either Radford or Virginia Tech that spend, you know, four years, six years, eight years, however long that they're here. Uh, and this becomes part of their life, part of their story. Uh, and it, it really allows them to build, you know, a connection and, and a, really an affinity for the community uh, we do see a number of uh, graduates that do want to stay um, here in the newer valley um, part of the brain drain study what we found that was unique to our region um, in, was that when we asked the students uh, we wanted to know their perceptions of of each region uh, and then also the perception of what um, what they were looking for in a community post-graduation 
And uh, the number one thing that they uh, ranked as a quality of life uh, asset that they were looking for was job opportunities. Uh, when the rest of them, and I forget, I think it was the outdoors and safety and I think housing, uh, we all, of our top five, we matched them except for the employment. Uh, when you looked at how they ranked us for employment, uh, we were either eighth or 12th, according to them, because they were that was a four-way tie. So that's been one of the challenges that we've been working on is that as we deal with local companies here, we know that there are job opportunities, but there's just a disconnect, uh, just like Jamie was talking about, where um, the students don't necessarily always engage with the broader community. So we've taken on some marketing initiatives and have been you know, much more visible on campus uh, where we go to career fairs and things like that and launched a job board where that's our product when we go in uh, to these you know, career fairs to make sure that we're not just pitching the quality of life, but we know we need to pitch that and we need to get them linked to job opportunities as quick as possible. All right. Uh we're going to have to leave there. John, Jamie, and uh, Charlie, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Gene. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org.